Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, this has been a Jekyll and Hyde week for the Calgary Flames. We've seen the good and we've seen the bad. And as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt to talk about both sides. Matt, let's just jump right into this week, shall we? Yeah, it was not a good start, but a good finish. Uh, the Flames on finished off their long road trip on the 16th, taking on the Nashville Predators in Nashville. I have to say this is probably one of the best games played against the Flames this year. But once again, uh, the Calgary Flames didn't give the run support probably needed to Jacob Markstrom and ended up falling 2-1 to the Predators. What were your thoughts here? Well, UC Soros is really good, for one. Um, yeah, Calgary, like, that uh, tying goal that was waved off was really the uh, knife that was the dagger, I think, in this one, where Calgary was trying really hard after falling down 2 nothing to get back into it and you know that, that goal pretty much the exact same play happened in the Tampa game and counted where ours didn't so you know it, it's one of those where it frankly like the NHL I think needs to sort out the whole uh, foot rule with the puck because like either like it hits your foot and it's no goal or like everything counts because it's so inconsistent where it, you know it's impacting games where like if the flames are tied in that one they probably end up pushing on to win uh, or at least get a point in overtime and instead it kind of threw off their rhythm I would have to go back and look at how many high danger chances the Flames had, but I mean, on most metrics of the score sheet, the Flames won this one. They had 39 shots, they had less penalty minutes, they had more blocks, less giveaways, but it just, I don't know, it, it felt like even though the Flames weren't playing bad hockey here for the end of the road game, they felt a little bit out of gas, I thought, and it also just felt like the Predators found ways to just neutralize them. Yeah, well, Calgary also has the very bad habit of not getting any chances from the high danger area right in front of the net. And it's hard when you're generating 39 scoring uh, shots on goal that, you know, you think, oh, well, the, the team's doing really well. But uh, frankly, I think the Flames had maybe six or seven shots from the high danger area in the game. And especially with a goalie like UC Soros, he's one of the best goalies in the league. He, you have to get right up in his face in order to actually beat him. And the Flames were only able to muster the one goal, and that wasn't enough. No, and I think we all attributed at the time to the end of the road trip. So, you know, the Calgary Flames came home after that trip. They got sleep in their own beds, and then they took on the Nashville, or sorry, the uh, Colorado Avalanche. And the last time the Avalanche played us in the Dome here was October 13th when Calgary beat them 5-3, to three, and you and I were very optimistic in that one. Uh, this time, not so much. This was, well, I don't want to call it a train wreck, but a terrible first period for the Flames. They looked like an AHL team in that one. They, I would say that they kind of got their mojo going again in the second, but they never really got to where they need to be. No, and as much as it... In both the games, it wasn't Markstrom's fault for the goals against. Um, the team just seems to not play the same way when he's in net lately, um, where too many breakdowns defensively lead to high danger scoring chances. And like the three goals that Colorado scored, uh, there was not really much that he could have done to stop any of them, but it's also like you're 10 minutes into the game and you're down three nothing uh you know the goalie needs to be able to make some impact in the game and uh, he really didn't uh, you know, uh, yeah uh, but i think there's a lot of guys at fault for that one. Oh, i agree it, it's also like you saw in the the following game with tampa that at times vladar actually stepped up and saved some of those really high danger scoring chances for the lightning and in both the nashville and the colorado game i never did not really see at least in the first period of either game markstrom actually making a difficult save 
Uh, he made the easy ones, but none that were anything above average. And th that's where, you know, you need your starting goaltender to occasionally steal a goal from the other team. Were you surprised in this Colorado game that the goaltenders weren't changed? Oh, I, I frankly was surprised that Vladar didn't start all three. Um, and, we talked about that last uh, week, and we'll come back to that thought. Yeah, it, it's one of those where, like, with how Vladar's basically been perfect in regulation over the last 11 starts, including the Tampa game, and then you have the other goalie, Markstrom, playing fairly subpar or just average uh, in games where he's actually playing well, he's just average. You know, like, it's... Yeah, and like the Flames are in the playoff push right now, and like they're outside of a playoff spot as we record this, and you know like points matter, and they're not far out of first in the division either. They're only seven points back of Vegas, and you know, and it's tough when you know you're playing goaltenders uh, that with Markstrom uh, playing him more frankly, than he has shown thus far through 47 games um, th that, like, he has been one of the worst goalies in the NHL, statistically. And that's, you know, it, it's not all his fault. You know, the team has been bad at times in front of him, but, you know, until he sorts himself out, like, you need to kind of move on from him as the starter, and Instead, it's, oh, well, Vladar gets a start here or there. He wins the game. And, well, that's just a break for Markstrom so he can go back in net. Uh, paraphrasing Sutter's comments before the Nashville game. And it's like, but Vladar won you the two games that he started. And uh, Markstrom lost his two starts. It's like, and then he then loses two more starts. And it's like... Well, you just blew four games due to your goaltender, That three of which were winnable. Hold that thought, Matt. Let's come back to that after we're done talking about the week. Yeah. It's just, yeah. <laughs> I mean, and again, I you know, yes, I think Marstrom didn't look good against the Avalanche, but nobody did. Like, this team did not look ready to no. play. And, you know, you I don't think you can blame this one on the goalie. Yes, the goalie no. looked bad, but the entire team, especially that first period, just looked terrible. And... For some reason, yeah. guys struggle no, when they come the home one... after a long road trip, but this was more than, you know, post-road trip struggles. Yeah, this was one where if the Flames were fl playing a farm team, we would have lost even. Like, they were just that bad. And You think they would have lost to the Rapid City Rush, our ECHL affiliate? Uh, it very well could have been. Uh, I'm not going to be, you know, I'm going to be blunt. Like, they were that bad in that game. Like... It was not anything that Colorado did that was spectacular. They just played their game. And, and you know, after one period, when Colorado was up by 3 nothing, I kind of knew it was done right there. Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, you can mail that one in. Like, Colorado is too good even with everybody out. Yeah, even with where they're on the stats, they're a team that knows how to shut a game down very quickly. Yeah. So, I mean, that was one that had to piss these guys off. You needed that to be your motivation. You needed that to piss the Flames off and, you know, kind of use that as a game to say, we'll never let this happen again. Well, I would say that happened because uh, on Saturday, the Flames played their matinee game against the Lightning as part of Hockey Day in Canada. Dan Vladar was in net, and boy, was this a fun Flames game to watch as a fan. We saw Jacob Peltier make his NHL debut. Um, we saw the Flames, I would say, play maybe the most impressive victory they've had this season and maybe one of the few times we can point to them playing almost 60 minutes. Yeah, it was just that one blip in the second period with the two quick goals where, you know, one was just a bad breakdown that landed right on the stick of Sam Coast, which, yeah, okay, <laughs> you know, that, that's a gimme there. And the other one was just a weird bounce which happens. And but, I mean, you know, with a team like Tampa, I kind of expected after the Stampo game for the Flames to be in a bit of a funk. And we did see Nemesnikov score shortly after that, less than a minute later. And I thought, oh, crap, the Tampa Bay's come back. They're going to swing the momentum. It's, I thought, honestly, the Flames were probably done at that point. So I would say good on this team to show the mental fortitude 
to stay in it. Yeah, well, especially with Toffoli responding uh, with Flames goal scorer Victor Hedman twice in this game. Uh, they scored off of him with the Toffoli and Anderson goals, which, you know, I was wondering if they banked another one off him if somebody would throw their hat. But, uh, you know. He'd have, uh, he'd have more goals for the Flames than Steve Smith. True. <laughs> Yeah, but... There's a reference we haven't made in a while. Steve Smith reference. Yep. Um, but, yeah, I mean, you know, it would... I think, especially after that that Colorado game, I didn't know how the Flames would respond. And, you know, we got the Kadri goal in the first, but it was still, I think, after the first anyone's game. And when the Lightning, you know, came in and took the lead, I, I really, I was worried. Oh, yeah, same here. And, like, when the Flames were only up one nothing after one period... It, despite dominating the lightning in the first you know anytime those type of games happen it's sort of pins and needles because if we have one bad bounce <laughs> then like you know so much for all your effort and now it's going the other way so like when tampa took the lead it was like oh here we go again and thankfully to was able to respond only like a minute or two later after the nemestikov goal and then we just carried the day the rest of the way. Yeah, and, you know, I mean, if you look at this, the Flames got 41 shots, the Lightning's 24. I would like to think that has a lot to do with the Flames' defense and keeping the Lightning, you know, out of the high-danger zones. Flames only won 36% of the face-offs, which is something they'll definitely need to wor work on. Um, had less penalty time, but, like, what wasn't there to like about this game? You had a fight, you had a little bit of everything you could want. I'm not a huge fighting guy, but it just seemed like if you had sort of a, a checklist of all the things you want in a hockey game, it checked off everything. Yeah, you had uh, pushing and shoving after the whistles, big hits by Zadorov, Lucic getting goals. into a fight. Uh, nine goals between the two teams like pretty much everything that you could want uh for an exciting game and uh to tampa's credit they didn't uh sh stop playing um they did manage to draw within one in the third period and were close uh to tying it uh thankfully for the huberdo empty netter and then the subsequent uh empty netter by coleman to end it but you know, like the, they were very close to squeaking out an overtime game in this one. And, you know, to their credit, even though they, they were flat and on the last game of their road trip, uh, it's, you know, full marks to them. And, like, they could have easily got two points out of this game. I'd rather not sit here and complain about officiating. I know that was one of the stories of this game for a lot of Flames fans. But I think it goes to what you were saying earlier about officiating. Like, Officiating in this league, it seems like more than any other league, really can change the output of a game and, and the outcome of a game, I should say. And I, I don't know, like, I don't know what the NHL can do better at that, but it just seems like of all the major sports, and I, I will say I'm not a huge fan of all of them, but when I'm reading articles and line on stuff and stuff, I don't see as much talk about inconsistent officiating as I do in hockey. Well, yeah, pretty much the only other comparable is the uh, strike zone in uh, baseball where... Uh, like, they're even talking about uh, removing the umpires from calling balls and strikes because it is that wildly inconsistent. Uh, well, I think one of the independent leagues tried some sort of a computer to do that. Yeah, uh, in AAA, uh, which is basically their version of the AHL, they're, they're going to be doing that this season to test it out to see how viable it is. Just because, like, in their, their league specifically, uh, the New York Yankees ended up being... Uh, getting the benefit of the doubt uh in like 30 percent of their calls um where like everybody else was like 50 50 so you know like it was heavily skewed towards the yankees favor and it it's one of those where you know it, it it's was it's getting to that level of like this is getting a little fishy in baseball that's why they're instituting that change and like with the kicking rule though um like it's just so ambiguous where like uh, coleman's goal that was waved off um uh, last year and uh, the edmonton game um we've seen like that exact same play this season being called a goal and yet like that was a series deciding goal last year and 
that was waved off and it, it it's just been so inconsistent where it's like you either have to call all of them back where like if it hits your leg and goes in it's just no goal or as long as the skate remains on the ice and you can like angle your foot to redirect it all of those count it's got to be like one or the other not oh well we don't feel like that one is but that one isn't and well and that's always been an nhl problem right even going all the way back to like oh four is what is a kicking motion it's never really been defined what a kicking motion actually is yeah and like that's where it has to be kind of an all or nothing because you know like you have basically the same play happened twice in the span of five days one costing the flames at least a point in the nashville game because it was the equalizing goal and the last goal in the game and then in the tampa game it, it the same play it, virtually identical plays and that one counted which could you know thankfully calgary came back but if Tampa had, say, gone on to win 2, 3, or 4, 1, you know, like, that that could have been a deciding goal there. And, you know, like, it, it, it's just... Because of the lack of consistency, even within the span of a week, with the same team, and basically having the exact same play happen, it's just very frustrating for fans, let alone the players and the coaches, because it's like, well... We, you know, you could even see with uh, Sutter and Kirk Muller on the bench when, uh, after the goal was scored, like they were both pointing at the ref, like you know they can't challenge What's going it. On? Yeah. You know, if they could challenge it, they would have. You know, because they're both exasperated because it's like we just had this happen, <laughs> and like that should be waved off, and yet no, oh that's fine, and it's like, but wait, huh? <laughs> Well, you know, I guess maybe this is something that will start coming up at GM meetings or something like that going forward. But it does seem like it's time that the NHL needs to somehow put some consistency around that. Yeah, and, you know, it's like when the, um, back in, like, 99 when they had that foot in the crease rule. You know, at least, like, that was consistent. It didn't matter if you only had, like, a fraction of an inch of your skate blade in the crease or you had your whole foot and leg in. If your foot was in and you scored, then the goal was waved off. And, you know, like there was no ambiguity at all. And even though that was a really bad rule, <laughs> the lack of ambiguity with that was actually a good feature because it was cut and dry. It's either your foot's in or it's not, and it's a goal or it's not. And, you know, like there was no second guessing it. Oh, well, they're going to call it this way today, but next week meh we're gonna call it completely different and it's just frustrating well something i guess is not frustrating was that we got to see jacob martin or uh, jacob peltier sorry for the first time as a calgary flame he was on a line with trevor lewis and walker doer played about six and a half minutes 13 shifts in this game what was your assessment of number 49 um he is going to be a calgary flame for a long time um, I really liked his game. I thought he knew the right areas that he needed to be. Uh, he had that one really dangerous scoring chance in the first period where he nearly scored his first NHL goal on his first shift. And he, he just uh, was in the right places at the right time. He got some power play time. He looked very effective. It's one of those things, as Daryl said afterwards, that he's only 21, and, you know, there's plenty of things to work on, which, of course, is true, but... For, we have guys in this team who are 30 and still plenty of things to work on. Yeah, it, and it's one of those, well, hey, you hit all the markers for what you, you were, were tasked with right now, so, hey, great, maybe you should get some more ice time next game. When you play your first NHL game, you're really not playing for a job, you're playing for another game, and I think... If he's not in on Monday against Columbus, there's going to be big questions to why. I think Jacob earned another game. Oh, easily. And I, um, if he continues to play like he did, I would not be shocked if he ended up earning some time on the second line instead of Lucic because his... Yeah, he his, and I have talked a lot about his that. His style of play and his uh, speed is very much more to the tempo that uh, Huberdeau and Kadri play at. Um, where Lucic is kind of not at that same pace. 
Uh, so, you know, if he continues to play well, it will be interesting to see. And one thing I am uh, actually pleased about uh, overall with all of the young players is that you look at guys like Phillips, Peltier, Ruzitska, Walker Dewar, Zahorna, all of them look like NHL players. And, you know, various places in the lineup, sure, but, you know, like all of them do not look out of place being in the lineup. And it'll be interesting to see moving forward, especially because of the fact that the Flames have so many veteran players and like moving into next year, if we're going to start to see the team perhaps shy away from signing some of those veteran guys and, and allowing the younger guys to come in because like Walker. I think that might just end up being a cap issue, Matt. Like if we look at how much money these guys have allocated that they don't this year to next year, you might have no choice. True. Uh, but, you know, like it's different where like if you're having to shoehorn somebody in just because of cap. Uh, like all of these guys look like reliable NHL players, and for sure. It, but I just think that they might not say, you know, let's err on the side of the veteran then. Let's err on the side of the rookie for, you know, yeah, hopefully the same price. Yeah, and I must say that uh, Walker Dewar has actually really impressed me uh, since he's been recalled, uh, reminding me quite a lot of uh, David Moss back in the day. Um, just that solid. Uh, fast guy who's big and does the right things uh perhaps not the most skilled of players but generally is in the right areas doing the right things at the right times so i saw a guy on uh, reddit who went out and bought a number 71 doer jersey and i said well i wouldn't make that investment but hey good for you yeah <laughs> well it would be um, a unique you know, one I'm... anyway that's true um I don't know about you. I thought Daryl Sutter's reaction after the game to Salem Volgi's question about what he thought about Jacob Peltier. I mean, okay, we got to preface that it's Daryl, but when he was asked how Jacob did, Daryl didn't even know Jacob's number. He asked what number is he, and then he just read the stats line off the game sheet. Like, I don't know. Did you find that to be at all disrespectful? I think that uh, Daryl was trying to make it about something other than the game. Um how do you say the flames over the years have uh anytime they've beaten a good team like tampa they tend to get a little bit over inflated and especially when like their next game is against the worst team in the nhl you know they kind of tend to take the next game off <laughs> and then lose badly um so i think daryl in this case was trying to make it about something other than their performance against the lightning and Peltier just happened to be the convenient victim of that. <laughs> um, like I, I do, how do you say, I don't think that, um, how he handled that was kind or pleasant. Um, and you know, kind of would give me a bad taste in my mouth if I was Peltier, but you know, uh, there's a difference between the show in the uh, press room uh, versus, you know, what's in the, the locker room. And I'm sure that Daryl... Let's just say it's maybe not the first time this year that Daryl Sutter has had less than kind things to say about Pelty. And it seems like... I understand Daryl not also want to inflate, you know, the kid or, you know, think that he's the best thing since, you know, the, the wooden... Since, the you know, the aluminum hockey stick or whatever, you know, you want to say. But I think that... He deserved more respect than that. If my read on uh, Pelty as a player uh, since uh, before he was drafted is that uh, he tends to play better when he's kind of pissed off. <laughs> um, so I'm wondering if it's also not some manipulation of uh, that aspect of, oh, well, you know, you can, can't even remember my number and are reading off my stat sheet. Well, I'm going to go show you the next game. Might be something, maybe, but you know, uh, but I mean, if he's going to be a top guy, you can't keep him pissed off for let's say ten years of flame. Oh no, and it, it's five uh, years from now, and he's your top guy. How do you play? Who? What numbers he still wear? I I don't remember that guy. <laughs> uh, but no, it, it's one of those where, um, 
how would you say? I think it, this is going to sound weird. I think Daryl's actually impressed with how he played. And so instead of gushing over him, uh, you know, and heaping praise well, on him. I wouldn't have even gushed, but just, you know, good game for the kid and leave it at that. Yeah, but it's also Daryl. <laughs> um, and he's always a smart ass when it comes to things like that. And I guess it was just the way it was oh, handled I agree. to me. Seemed like, disrespectful. Yeah, I agree. Like, uh, I don't mind Daryl being a smartass most of the time, but this just seemed. And usually, it's Daryl sort of being a smartass to one of the reporters. And I mean, we heard it. I think after the uh, the Colorado game, Wes asked a question. Wes Gilbertson, and he said, "If that's what you want to write, write that." Like, it's towards the media, which there's always sort of been this adversarial relationship. But when it's one of the guys on your team. It's very different. I agree. And and I guess when he's not doing it to the goalie, you know, but you're doing it to this guy, like there's other guys that maybe deserve that, that criticism a little bit more. I agree. And it's frustrating because, like, we don't have the other side of the coin of knowing, like, what's going on in the room uh, specifically. Uh, but, yeah, like, it, it, it was not the classiest way of going about it. Uh, by Daryl, and especially in the context of, well, you sat the kid for basically a month before actually playing him, and the kid actually has a good game, and you can't even be bothered to say anything, even... Well, and, and I think that's the big thing, Matt. Like, I could see if he just got called up from uh, the Wranglers that day, he had never been up here before, you know, if it was like a Walker Dewar or a Radham Zahorna playing their first game, I could see that. But you bring this kid on the road trip, you string him along, you don't play him, you cut him last in the preseason, you talk about how he didn't have a good preseason. Like, I don't know, Daryl's throwing a lot of shade towards um, Peltier and it just feels like, you know, this was the time that that he des maybe deserved the coach's pat on the back. Oh, I agree. And we'll see. Um <sighs> It, I think it largely will depend on his usage moving forward. And, you know, it, it's tough because, like, it was not an artful way of going about it at all. And, you know, like, this is, how do you say, his overall handling of the young prospects in that is kind of turning off a lot of, probably a lot of people from wanting to come to the Flames. Uh, because, like, if you're under six feet tall, uh, which basically is all of the Flames' good offensive prospects, um, and, <laughs> you know, you're still slaying the AHL, like, all three of Peltier, Zari, and uh, Phillips are in the top ten in scoring in the AHL, and, you know, like, you're being strung along, and you're barely playing, and then... Even in the games that you do play, you're getting under seven minutes, and then you're getting that kind of a commentary. You know, like, if I'm Matthew Coronado, I'm kind of like, uh, is this BS going to happen when, you know, it's his turn? Because he can walk away, and Calgary can be stuck without a, you know, with only getting a second-round pick in return. And, like, that's kind of chintzy, you know, especially... Daryl's starting to seem like the old man who's telling the, the kids to get off his lawn. Yeah. You damn kids! Oh, I know. And it's one of those things that, like, if this kind of stuff continues to happen from Daryl, like, it's going to hurt the organization. And, you know, like, it, it it's... How do you say? It's fine in the isolated incident that happened. But, you know, it's one of those where, like, especially if Peltier continues to play like he did, he deserves more ice time and, like, more minutes, like, second line ice time and to see more of him. And, you know, like, if he's not getting those chances and opportunities, even if he's playing like that, then, you know, it's deeply concerning, uh, frankly, um, for the organization because... Like, you're literally not putting your best players in uh, just to satisfy, like, veteran guy Milan Lucic, which, you know, to be fair, he's doing his best, but, like, th that he's a fourth-line guy, and he's playing with two of the star players in the NHL, and he has, like, four points in 13 games. Like, that's not good enough. And He's playing his role, but he's, yeah, I, I think 
we, we all know what you're saying here is Peltier needs to play. You need to give the kids respect. And to me, whether you're 18 or 80, if you're on the team, you deserve the same respect as everybody else. I agree. And you've made the NHL at that point. And whether Daryl wants, you know, whether it was Daryl that said you had to be dressed or the GM or whoever it is, these are your guys. And, you know, especially after a first game that needs to be celebrated. Yeah. You don't even say he's the best player to ever hit the ice, but you need to celebrate, you know, the achievement that it is of playing your first game. Yeah. No. And like, and especially he was successful in his first game. Like, it's not like he just was like barely noticeable, had like five shifts and, oh, okay. Yeah. That guy played like he was noticeable every time he was on the ice. And it's like, you, you know, that that's a good thing and a positive sign. And like, you might have a top six forward emerging on your team, like a legit guy from your own organization. Like that's awesome. And you know, it's one of those where, you know, like you actually have to treat the players like that. They actually matter. (laughs) And you know, not, you know, like, Oh, you're inconvenient. (laughs) With that win over the Tampa Bay, Daryl Sutter now becomes the coach with the most wins in franchise history. He has 194 wins, overtaking Badger Bob Johnson by one. Badger Bob has 193. Fred Creighton has 156. He coached in Atlanta. Terry Crisp, 144. Bob Hartley, 134. It surprised me that Bob's up that high. Um, Sutter's... Sutter's only second in regular season games coach as a head coach with 369, trailing Bob Johnson's 40. So he's 31 games behind Bob Johnson. We have, what, 37 games left in the season? So he'll be holding on to that record by the end of the year, too. Yeah. But uh, with that win and, I guess, the two losses this week, the Calgary Flames now sit uh, third in the wildcard race. They have 47 points, 22 wins, 16 losses, nine overtime losses for a total of 53 points, tied with Colorado, who are the second wildcard team. And then, of course, the Los Angeles uh, Kings are the first wildcard team at 56. Edmonton holds down the third spot in the Pacific Division with 57 points. So once again, the Flames uh, on the outside looking in in terms of a playoff picture. Yeah, and it's frustrating because you look at the other teams in the division and like Vegas has looked rather human lately. Uh, LA has fallen back. Uh, Calgary is poised to jump up the standings if they actually play well. And, you know, like going back to what I was saying earlier, like three of the four starts with uh, Markstrom uh, being in uh, the Nashville, St. Louis, Chicago, and Colorado games. Like realistically, only the Colorado game uh, like was a legit loss um, where – like, if the Flames had better goaltending in all three of the other games, you know, like, the Flames could have earned an additional four points because they did get the two overtime points. But, you know, like, the, there was four points sitting on the table that they could have had had they had better goaltending. And, you know, uh, it's tough moving forward, especially, like, the Flames are going to be playing a lot of mediocre teams. And you know, like they can't be coughing up points left, right, and center to like the Nashvilles and the Chicago's and the Columbuses of the world or the St. Louis's like those teams are all bad and they should be beaten. And yet Calgary is just giving away points and it, you know, like that has to change. Otherwise the flames might miss the playoffs. You know, I mean, we've talked about it and we'll talk about it again later with a letter from a uh, reader here, but you know, on paper, this team looks good. And when we see good games, like we see that game that the Flames played against Tampa Bay, we know they can do this. But they're just so inconsistent. And I wonder, you know, we talked about Pelte, and you talked about, you know, giving Pelte a shot. I ran it on that last week. We talked last week about Dan Vladar. Like, I think Daryl has an over-reliance in a lot of ways on veterans. And, you know, well, our starter is Jacob Markstrom. And at some point, I think you've just got to play the best guy, whether he's you know, 18 or 80. And it, like I said earlier, it almost feels like, you know, Daryl get off my bench, you damn kids. Like, you know, like, I I don't know. I I don't know what the issue is here with the inconsistency, but at this point, looking at the team now, I'm not convinced if these guys make the playoffs, they're making it out of the first round. Well, and that, that's the thing. Like you look at 
the divisional opponents. Like Vegas looks very human this year. Seattle's flying over their head. Um, like they're not, you know, from what I've seen of their games, like they're good, but they're not that good. It, it, and you know, like they're kind of, they're probably about eight or 10 points ahead of where they should be based on their talent. Um, Edmonton sucks just generally, um, outside of McDavid and Dreisaitl, they're one of the worst teams in the league. It's just that they have the two best players in the NHL, so that helps a lot. And Los Angeles is extremely mediocre. Uh, so, like, Calgary, like, if they get to the playoffs, like, they could beat any of those four teams. But it, it's But we tough. can barely string two wins together. Why do you think we're going to get four or seven? Well, and that's the frustrating part because in a lot of ways, like in a lot of the games, like they're doing a lot of the right things. And it's just, well, like how many times has Markstrom let the Flames down for one? Like if the Flames were just getting league average goaltending from their starter and their backup, not anything other than just right down the middle, like the Flames are probably leading the conference right now. And... It, like, that's just how abysmal the goaltending has been. You know, it's difficult when, you know, like your defense, you look at uh, the St. Louis game, uh, the one that uh, they coughed up the lead um, in the third period, like they had to stop playing the way that they were in order to go into a defensive shell because, oh God, Markstrom's going to let in anything now. And, you know, like there's just no flow when like the team itself has to like overcompensate because the goaltender is bad. And it's one of those things that like when the flames have Ladar on net, they're just free to do where like the occasional mistake that happens, they can trust that Ladar is going to It'd be very different if we had two subpar goalies. No, but we have one that's actually playing well and they're not playing them, which is the extremely frustrating part of this all. One. And, and I think not only is he, Doing well? Uh, again, I think it goes back to the Daryl Sutter narrative we've talked about for a number of weeks. He's a young goalie. Yeah. He's not just the backup. I mean, you see some teams like, you know, Aaron Dell or Derek Riddick as backups. Like those are older goalies. This is a young goalie, and he's not getting played. And I don't want to blame it all on the goalie either, but you're right. The team doesn't play well with Markstrom and Nett. And, Matt, I mean, at what point, at what point do we have to start looking at this team and having a serious discussion of if this Flames team is going to make it out of round one? Well, and that's the thing. Like, it it depends on the mindset of the team. Like, uh, how would you say? Like, if they were, are able to get that second line sorted out with, you know, say, insert Pelte or and, 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 whomever, but, like, a legit guy on that second line, like, foundationally, like, the team doesn't really have m much in the line of weaknesses where, like, they can steamroll teams like Tampa the other day, but they need to have enough from, you know, like the goaltender or the uh, depth defenseman or this or that. And, you know, it's like playing Lucic in a spot where, like, you, you've seen so many plays lately where Huberdo and Kadri are doing everything to like generate a scoring chance and then they pass it to Lucic and the play dies. And it's like, you know, like all of these things are just holding the team back from actually actualizing their abilities. Like the, this team is on par in terms of talent with the team they had last year. And you know, it's slightly, and it's even some of the teams you're talking about earlier. When I look at some of the teams ahead of us, we're, we're better talent than some of the teams ahead oh, of yeah. us. Uh, the only team, frankly, that I think is legitimately better than us is Colorado. Every other team, I think the Flames are better than. I think Vegas, nah, I could argue, is better than it, us. It, it's one of the worst goaltending. It, it's uh, the uh, some of their. Let's just say, yeah. I think Vegas is better than us just because maybe they have a history of winning. Yeah, I, I can core. agree with that. Yeah. It's just, it's frustrating because, like, this team, like,. It would be one thing, like, if none of the Flames' prospects were doing anything at all and, like, you know, we're just an embarrassment down in the farm. 
like so many of the years like where like the Oxarban Knights and you know like Adirondack Flames where like the teams were just horrid <laughs> um you know like the flames actually have a bunch of high quality prospects that are ready to step into the nhl and well and also high quality nhlers like, yeah you know tree living went out and put a good team on the ice this year. yeah and yet like certain guys are getting played in roles that they shouldn't and you know it's also tough like with uh shillington not being here uh because i think like the flames defense is sorely missing him and hopefully he comes back soon. Um, well, we actually have an update on him. Should we pause and I'll give you that? Yeah, sure. Uh, Frank Cervelli was on uh, Fan 960 co- about a, two weeks ago and discussed the Flames' upcoming approach to the trade deadline. And some of that centered around the Flames knowing what they have on the blue line. So I will link this in the show notes for this week if anyone wants to see the article, the transcription of this. Thanks to our friend Ryan Pike over at Flames Nation. But this is the quote from Frank Cervelli. But I think when it comes to talking about the Flames and their deadline, it can't be overstated how critical it is for them to get an answer on Oliver Shillington. This is probably number one in terms of their priorities right now. I did follow up today on Shillington, and what's happening is he's still receiving assistance from the player assistance program. He's on their cap, has been there all year, and I think there was some hope he might be able to come back over to North America before the holidays, and that didn't materialize. And I think now everyone's wondering, is this going to happen? Is he going to play this season? And I think without putting too much pressure on him, ideally the Flames would really like to know before the end of January, end quote. They also talked um, about uh, Cervelli, or sorry, um, Cervelli said later in the interview that I guess he knows that Shillington has been skating with a team over there. So obviously a different level of, of hockey, but you know, it's not like he hasn't put his skates on since the summer. So like you said, I mean, we're still trying to figure out what to do with Shillington, but that also isn't the source of our problems. Like you can't say, you know, it's not like because Shillington is not here, the flames suck. It's definitely one of many things, but I just, I, I don't know, Matt. I can't. I don't know why they're so inconsistent. Well, and I think uh, part of it is that, um, like, just the nature of uh, how they're generating their offense. Like, it, it's like they're getting a ton of shots every game, but like they're just wasting them from really bad areas. And like, it's okay to take point shots if you're getting traffic in front, but very seldom do they have anybody in front and. Like, just how the whole offensive structure of the team is composed, it just does not make sense with the personnel they have. And, like, nobody is going to any of the high-danger areas until, like, Manjapane recently has been. Uh, but Coach Sutter told us before the season started that we're not going to get as many goals, and I think we all knew that, right? We don't know where those goals are going to come from. And, you are you know, you're talking about Manjapane. He, in general, has, n- I mean, not been where he needs to be this year, and... Matt, tell me if you think this is maybe a fair assessment. I think a big reason the Flames are slumping, nobody's stepping up. I mean, we knew that Lindholm, we knew that Toffoli, we knew that Huberto, we knew that Kadri would be our good players. You know, we were looking for a guy like Manjapani to step up. We were looking for a guy like, um, you know, maybe Dubé to step up, and arguably he has, but we don't have enough guys stepping in to really show us that they can be those those higher end NHL players. Yeah. And that's where, you know, like having the high end prospects that we do, um, you know, giving them a shot in, you know, cause like when you have guys that are underwhelming, like blue Cheech in a prime scoring role, it, it's difficult for the team to engage what they actually need at the trade deadline. Other than, oh, our second line is horrible because we have a fourth liner shoehorned in there. And, you know, like, okay, yeah, you can go get the second line guy, mm-hmm. but why spend the assets if you have a young guy that can actually play at that level if you don't actually give him a shot to see if he can play at that level? And, like, that's where I think a lot of the disconnect between, like, the management and Sutter has been is that, like, the team needs to know, like, can Phillips or Peltier actually play that second-line role effectively? And Well, even if you're Daryl and you don't want to put a young guy in there for whatever reason, fine. Okay, so let's look at the third line. 
Andrew Mangiapane, maybe not where he needs to be. Michael Backlund is in the right spot. Blake Coleman's looked great over the past couple weeks. When do you reward him with that second line spot and move Lucic down to line three then? Like, when do you kind of shuffle those assets you already have if you don't want to play the other guy? I agree. And it's one of those where, you know, I think that they'll probably end up keeping that third line together just because they're playing very well with each other. And, you know, like, it's kind of like they have a, a very adequate first line and their third line is probably the best in the NHL currently. Um, so it's like, you know, and the fourth line's playing respectably. So it's kind of like, okay, well, if you can fix the problem on the second line, independent of like taking, robbing Peter to pay Paul, you know, like you're pretty much okay type of thing. It's just fixing that one problem and going from there and right now like uh there's just no flexibility on trying new things on that second line like throwing Ruzitska in there like I think Ruzitska would play well there and he's more of a veteran than Peltier and I think that Peltier would play perfectly well there but neither of those guys are giving well getting a and, shot. and only in that second line by itself is the issue here no. either. like you know I mean yeah okay we started slow Huberto needed some time to get going that sort of thing but it just I don't know. Like, I think you can only put so many, you know, so many different iterations of this team out there. It's, it's a team issue. Like these guys can't string together more than two, three wins in a row. And, you know, even uh, Ian Perkins uh, commented on one of our previous episodes and said, I'm not sure if changing the coach will make a difference to me. The flames see one step seem to be one step behind or just missing on passes. My real concern is the drive to the net. Lots of shots, but these shots are into the belly of the goalie. Like it just, I, I don't know. Like it's, it just feels like these guys, something is missing. And I don't think it's necessarily a piece on the ice. I think you could put a serviceable enough team together as you were talking about Rajishka. I mean, I would say Peltier is not a first line winger, but he's serviceable enough there. But I just feel like there's something going on and, you know, between the ears as my dad used to say, you know, in their heads. And I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's a clash between players and coaches behind the scenes. I don't know if there's some bad apples in the dressing room, but it just feels like there's something going on here that we can't see. Yeah. And it, you look at the team and I think like it also, it's one of those where it's like death by a thousand cuts where like, because like say, and I'm just going to throw the, you know, Marks from under the bus just to start this, but it's not entirely his fault. But, you know, like if Marks from plays bad, then the team has to play completely different from their game plan in order to shelter Marks from, which then cascades all over the place. And so, like, they can't even get their uh, one foot in front of the other because by the time the game starts, it's already like 2 nothing, And, you know, it's one of those where. You know, like, yeah, the second line's not being effective. Stone being playing all the time is not being effective. Markstrom playing too much is not being effective. But, like, when... Sort of death by a thousand cuts. Yeah, but, like, when Vladar is starting and, you know, like, the team is confident, like, they can steamroll teams. And, like, that's part of the reason why, like, they're, they've won 11 in a row. Or not lost in regulation. I mean, uh, they're 8-0-3. In their last 11 with Vladar starting and it's like you know if they can have that consistency with you know not having to worry about the goaltender as much then you know they can actually assert their game properly and like we're seeing the flames being able to score five six seven goals when when Vladar is in that and yet struggling mightily to get anything together when Markstrom is I don't think we're going to see big changes to the way this team is built. As much as we might want to, I don't think we're going to see, you know, Dan Vladar getting the starts. I don't think we're going to see Peltier getting, you know, a ton more time on the high lines. Just based on what Daryl's done so far, I don't think that his outlook changes a whole ton in the last 37 games. So, I mean, you know, not looking maybe at the the blue sky, but looking at the reality of where we're at is like what is the Calgary Flames team as we look ahead to the rest of 2023? Well, that's the hard part because like they are better than their results and significantly better than their results and based on what we're seeing are they a playoff team? 
they should be vying for the division. Like it, you know, they should be right up. They're not even that far. They're only seven points behind Vegas and, you know, less like three behind LA three behind or four behind Edmonton and five behind Seattle. Like they're not far back of those teams where like, if they pick up the two wins against Chicago and Columbus this week, like that narrows the gap to like three points. And, you know, it, it, it's one of those where, like, Calgary just needs to string. But to- Calgary can't be good teams. They can't be bad teams. Like, my issue, Matt, is I. You're right. Any of the teams above us, you said earlier, they can beat. I don't disagree with that. Can they beat them four times? And they should be able to. Other than Colorado, I don't think they have that in them. But you know, um, I'm right. Right now, I. My heart says as a playoff team. The results in the ice, honestly, I'm going to make a bold prediction. I think the Flames missed this year. And I would not be surprised about that either. And I think if they do, somebody's head's going to roll, whether it's Treliving, whether it's Sutter. I don't know who's, but you don't go out and do what Tree did this summer, miss the playoffs and go, ah, well, better luck next year, boys. Oh, yeah, no. Um, I think you're going to see a wholesale change. Uh, new general manager bringing in a new coach, frankly. So get get your resume ready. Well, it's one of those where, like, if the team misses the playoffs, like, that's a debacle, uh, frankly. Even if the Flames are out in the first round, like, this is a team, like you said, that should go deep. This team, when we look at it on paper, is a deep team. And if they're out in round one, I mean, even last year they went to round two, right? Great round one victory. We're all so stoked. They got their butts handed to them by the Oilers. If this team goes out in round one, I think you know, heads still roll. Maybe not as many or maybe not as far down the Saddle Dome uh, parking yeah, lot, but like heads it, still Yeah, roll. like it depends on who their opponent is. Like if they match up against Edmonton and get blown out again, then yeah, the heads are going to roll again, like just as badly. It's just, it, it's frustrating because of the fact that like this team shows all the signs of getting it together and then they pull what they did against Colorado this week. And it's like, it you know and it's normal to have bad games and like i'm not you know harping on them for that like you know we're past the point of bad games though it was bad games in october and november yeah well like i i said at the beginning of uh the month where like if the flames went 500 against the good teams and then um won two out of three against the poor teams uh that you know that that would be a successful month and, you know, they did go 500 exactly against the four good teams that they played. Um, they lost to, to uh, I think it was Winnipeg and uh, Colorado, and they beat Tampa and Dallas. Um, but even like that Dallas game, I mean, we were up 6, what was it, 6-1 at one point. Like, you know, they almost blew that one. So even though you're technically getting the two points, oh, I know. you got to do better. Oh, I'm not saying like it was perfect. But, uh, you know, and that's a game again, where I think the problems between the ears and it's been the same way for years. And I thought changing the core was going to change on here, but there's obviously something in the air at the saldo. Maybe it's still, I don't know, mold from the floods how many years ago, (laughs) but there's, there's something going on there that, you know, this team just never performs up to standard. Yeah. Well, like, and that's the thing, like if they continue on this week and like they beat the uh, Columbus blue jackets and the uh, Chicago Blackhawks, you know, like they're basically meeting the mark that I said at the beginning of the month, though. And like, it's frustrating because like the the in game results are so like scatter shot, and yet like thus far they're actually basically on pace for where they should be, which is also kind of bizarre. And you know, it, it's frustrating because. You know, like, I think everybody would like this team to, like, go on that seven, eight game winning streak like we've seen. It's just that there's just enough off where they can't seem to get a full run going yet. But, like, if they can figure out some of those wrinkles, like, say you start Vladar four or five games in a row and he actually plays as he has. But realistically, is that going to happen now? Possibly. Like, you know, like, when you have 
literally one goalie being eight zero and three in his last eleven starts, and the other guy basically losing every game because of him. But this was the week for that, and it didn't happen. And Daryl even said, like you mentioned earlier, that well, it just gave Markstrom a rest. Like, what evidence do we have that Daryl's going to do that? I know, and. It's one of that's what I mean by is it really going to happen? Like if you were coach or I was coach or heck, if Bruce Boudreaux somehow becomes a coach now he's looking for a job, like anybody else would do that. But I have no reason to think that Daryl Sutter is going to do that. I would like to think Daryl's going to, but based on Daryl's track record this year, Vladar is our starter for better or for worse in sickness and health. Yeah, well, and that's until death to him in the net part. Yeah, and like that's where it's frustrating because like this team has all of the parts they need it's just uh <laughs> you know what i mean like you know like they're basically getting in their own way at this point and like that's the difficult part is that like they're like they should be able to steamroll these teams and yet they're not and you know it, it's just tough because like this team is how would you say it? It's not like where you look at the team and you go, oh, wow, they suck just because, like, they don't have, you know, like they're missing this player and this player and this player and this player. So it's obvious why they're in the middle of the pack. Like, you look at Nashville, you can understand why they're where they're at. But, you know, like, Calgary. Calgary's getting what we deserve this year. Let's be honest. The Flames are yeah. getting exactly what they deserve for the games they're playing. Oh, I agree. But it, it's. Also different because of the fact that, like, the Flames have more than to show. And yep. we'll see. Like, it, it, that's part of the problem. Like, we're still, like, even though we're at the middle of January, like, you know, if you throw up, like, the before November, like, end of November part of the schedule, like, the Flames are starting to actually turn things around. It's just... You know, so when do we when do we get to the point in overturn? When do we get to the point where if the Flames are still mediocre, they're not coming back? Well, frankly, if the Flames are, you know, basically dead in the water, um, outside of a playoff spot near the trade deadline, um, then just I think you kind of ride with what you got and see. Uh, you know, like the last month of the schedule for the Flames is ridiculously easy. Um, and but like how would you say it? even though the schedule is easy when we're playing easy teams we're not beating them like to me that doesn't really matter right now no i know it's one of those we like, can't beat chicago well it's like last year um when the flames went out and got to fully um so, uh Tra living said that you know because the flames were playing so well that they invested in the team and i think that you know like if they don't show signs of life by the end of next month uh, at the trade deadline, then like there's really no need to invest in this team further because like, why are you going to just waste draft picks on a team that can't get their stuff together? You know, like if by then, I think even if they're not dead in the water, even if they're a, a mediocre, you know, maybe number two in the wild card, I think at that point you've got to run with what you've got. Cause you don't want to invest in trying to solve a problem that at right this point, I don't know is solvable. Yeah. You know, last year was very different, but I don't want them to go blow a whole bunch of assets to bring in one guy at the deadline and it still doesn't work and we blow all those assets. Like, to me, yeah. if you're even, I don't know what you think, but if you're even in that spot where you're still battling for the number two wild card, you got to run with what you got. Yeah. Oh, no. And it, it's just tough, frankly. Like, you, you look at, um, like, if you throw out the first two months of the season, right? Uh, just for, like, all, everybody adjusting to the new team like the flames record um in uh, december was actually uh nine three and four which that's actually really good and thus far this month uh i don't deny they have a good record on paper but they can't even string wins together yeah and the wins they are getting to me, don't look like playoff team wins most of the time. Like I said, that Dallas game, we're up by five and we, you know, almost blow that. Like, you know, the, the this team, even when they're getting the wins, even though the record is coming together, I don't see playoff team 90% of the nights as teams on the ice. Yeah. Well, like, uh, since this... And you know as well as I do, that that tempo game was great. It's, we're not going to get the same game against Columbus. This team's too inconsistent for that. Oh, I agree. 
But, you know, like, uh, since this team has basically adjusted to being together, uh, they're 13, 6, and 6, which is actually rather good. Uh, you know, as much as, like, we're complaining about inconsistency and, you know, like, not having everything go right, yeah, everything has been a bit of a cluster. <laughs> you know, throughout the the last two months. I'm not going to argue. It's just that, like, they are getting results since they've been doing things, you know, like, with the familiarity that they are. They're, the holes that are in the lineup are becoming readily apparent and easily provable, observable, et cetera, et cetera. So it's one of those things. And like you said, we probably have the things we need to at least plug those holes for this year. Yeah. In, you know, in the AHL. Yeah. I'm not saying that they'll be the right plug forever, but we can probably plug those holes and not spend a lot of assets this year. No, like realistically, like if at the trade deadline, you just uh, say bring in uh, a sixth defenseman for like a fourth round pick like we've seen every year like that's that's brad's favorite deadline yeah the Derek forbort oscar fantenberg eric gustafson you know special you know insert you know this year's version of that uh you know say luke shen from vancouver um you know you could throw that guy in as like the number six just to keep stone out of the lineup all the time you know like that would basically be the only trade that i would actually make at this point and uh just getting a reliable number six and so what do we do at this point to get daryl to play the kids obviously not you and me but what does the organization do well and that's the thing like you just have to kind of plug get hope that you know like if peltier continues to play well that he earns the spot and, like, Rajitska, when he's been playing, like, even though he's been demoted to the fourth line, he's been one of the most effective players on the team. When he's actually out there, it's just, you know, being sheltered on the fourth line instead of Lucic being down there. And, you know, like, eventually things get to a, a spot, like with Markstrom's poor performance, where it's like, yeah, you have to put the other guy in. And, like, Lucic has been bad for, you know, like, his last stretch of games. Like, for the line mates he has, like, four points does not cut it. And, you know, like, you have to figure that... I think that, like, once the change is made, like, where Ruchit score or Peltier is put on that second line, that, like, that line will take off. It's just, you know, it, they're all being basically forced because of mediocrity. <laughs> from that group that you know and it's just frustrating because like lucic is a perfectly valuable player to play on the fourth line he brings that lucic presence when he plays it's just that he's not the guy he was 10 years ago where he could put up 60 points and while doing that and you know we'd be having a different conversation if he was but you know, it's just tough right at this point. Well, we're running a little bit long, so let's wait and see what happens yeah. this week and where it, we might get Peltier going. I know. It, how would you say it? Everything is just frustrating because things need to change and shift, but they're not changing and shifting in order to... Well, and they need to change and shift, but I think we can also see what needs to change. It's not like some years where we've said, we need to change, but we don't know what. Yeah. Like, I think the, the answers are in front of us. Oh, for sure. Or at least potential answers. I agree. And, it, well, yeah. <laughs> well, before we do our uh, weekly predictions, we had uh, an email come in from a, an old friend of the show, Al. And he was responding to my rant last week. And I think everyone who listens remembered that. It says, hi, Dan and Matt. Thoughts. As individuals, the Flames are made up of talent that's at least as good as the Jets on paper. Assuming there are no bad apples in the locker room, personalities-wise... The contention has to be that there's a problem at the coaching level, question mark. Definitely need to play Vladar more. Enough of being respectful to the so-called starting goalies. What the hell does a player in the team have to do to get respect from the coach? Same for the youngsters. Sutter treats them like crap. This was the way he was dismissing publicly the kid. He said his name escaped him, but it's Peltier. 
for being too short before he even hit the ice was appalling. I hope the kid's character shines through and he's getting good coaching from elsewhere, especially about when and when not to listen to old farts who are stuck in their ways. See, Dan, I can rant too. Keep up the good stuff, guys. So I think that Al's pretty much covered everything we talked about here. You know, like we need a, we need change here and Daryl needs to do things differently. And Matt, I guess my closing thought to you, do you, do you still think Daryl Sutter will be the Flames coach at the end of the season? Or do you think he's like Bruce Boudreaux and showing the door in midseason? Uh, I think that, um, let's see how the next like few weeks go. Uh, I'm kind of, you know, uh, frankly, you know, Calgary is reminding me a lot of the St. Louis blues from a few years ago where like everything was just going wrong for the blues. That was the year that they ended up winning the Stanley cup. I'm not making that comparison, but you know, and like just getting a new voice helped to just unlock everybody from you know the malaise that they were in and you know like it's getting to a point where i think that you know like if this kind of stuff continues where you know it's just you know like it is what it is then i i think that you know getting a different voice in there entirely uh to you know unlock the players from you know being so focused on what they're doing might help, but do you bring in, do you bring in Boudreau? Uh, no, I've ne- I, I personally have never liked Bruce Boudreau as a coach. So like, I've never wanted him on the flames as a coach ever. So, you know, that's not a slight to him. Like he does a perfectly good job with the types of teams that he does, but it's just, how do you say uh, Daryl's teams tend to be like overly defensive to the point where it interferes with the team at times. Boudreaux's is like the exact opposite where it's too offensive and not defensive enough to the point where it screws the team over because they're too loose. And, you know, you kind of need to find like that happy medium between the two. Well, let's uh, revisit that thought after we see how the team does this week and after the bye week. So, we are now down to our last three games before the Flames take a week off. As always, they have this bye week around the All-Star game. So the Flames will, will finish off January with the Columbus Blue Jackets coming to town on Monday night. The Chicago Blackhawks coming to town on Thursday night. That's 7.30, sorry, 7.30 start time against Columbus, 7 o'clock in Chicago, and then a back-to-back with Seattle on Friday. The Monday night game to me is the most interesting one here, just because I'm curious about what happens with uh, Johnny Hockey coming back to town. I would say this for fans that are going to be there. Cheer and make some noise and show your appreciation for what Johnny did here during the tribute video, and then boo him every time he's on the ice, because bad players don't get booed. I think it's a sign of respect to boo Johnny. Yep. I agree, and it's one of those, uh, you know, like how everything shook out that it was what it was and you know you can have your animosities for him for that but you know he was the face of the franchise for seven years so you know cheer him for that and as you said boo him mercilessly for everything else um any question that peltier is in on monday he better be uh, if not, that's where I could see there being a coaching change. If, yeah. You know, there's after that last game, if he's not, I can see there being some issues. Oh yeah. That. No, like if he gets pulled from that, like it, 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 even after like say the Columbus game, he plays just as good and he gets pulled from the lineup for whatever reason, then it's like, yeah, you're being completely disingenuous and you're putting your own ego in front of the team and you're harming the team actively and get out. You know, period. Like that. Put it this way, that would cause me to be on the all aboard the fire Daryl Sutter train. Like, you know, like I I can kind of understand Phillips. I'm still a little annoyed by that one, but you know, he is very tiny and he didn't really show a ton. Like he looked good, but you you know, Jacobs at least deserved enough to get one more game. Yeah, and. Jacob, he is a lot bigger physically where like, there's no excuse not to play him over his size. So it like, there are uh, about a hundred players that are Peltier's height in the NHL. 
So like, there's really no excuse. Like, yeah, Phillips is like, would be one of the five shortest players in the league. And sure. I can understand the trepidation there, but like Peltier, there's zero excuse on that front. So that would, what's your prediction for the week, man? Uh, they should win all three and I'll just leave that as my prediction. Uh, do I think they're actually going it's been to your prediction for three weeks in a row and hasn't served you? Well. I know. And uh, realistically, I think they lose the week. <laughs> so yeah. Uh, but I'll go with that. They win the week. So I'm going to be a little more optimistic, uh, than you are. I'm going to say, I think they lose Columbus. I think that after that big Tampa Bay game, I just, I, I don't know. The flame seems to get a big win and they seem to fall flat the next game. That seems to be their MO this season. So I think they'll fall flat against Columbus. Sadly, I think they lose Chicago, and I think they'll win against Seattle. Yeah, I can see that. Um, I, I actually think that they'll lose all three. I'm saying they'll win all three, but I think they'll actually end up losing all three. Should I just put you down for win all three for the rest of the season? No. Uh, it, it, Even if there's only two games that week, win all three. Yeah, it, it's one of those that um, just... Uh, you can tell I'm getting annoyed with the team a bit when I start going, oh, they're going to win or lose all three because it's like uh, you guys should be playing better. <laughs> and, yeah, but, yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah. Where do you play Dan Vladar? All three. Where do you think realistically Dan Vladar plays? None. <laughs> See, I, I'm with you. Dan, this is, just like last week, this is a week to give Vladar going. I think... Well, it's a back-to-back. -back. I think Vladar gets one on the back-to-back. -back. I think Vladar gets the road game on the back-to-back. -back. Yeah, I, I think Markstrom plays all three. So, And then you give him a week off? Yep. And then we see Markstrom right back at it next week, like in on the sixth. So, Yeah. Well, I guess we'll see. Um, we should also note before we take off this week that the All-Star voting is done. The Flames will not have another person go in the All-Star game, probably deserved. It's only going to be Nazem Kadri representing us to the All Star Game. Yep, makes sense. So Matt, let's uh, let's get out of here and let's watch and see what happens tomorrow when Johnny Goudreau comes to town. Boo! Um, as always, go Flames, go. Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.